For as long as I can remember, I have had something of a hyperactive imagination. I get lost in extremely vivid daydreams, and I'm not just talking crap when I use the word vivid. I can smell the scents in the air and feel the texture of the objects beneath my fingers. If I eat or drink something, I can taste it. The wind ruffles my hair and the ground is solid beneath my feet. These daydreams are so hyper-realistic, I have trouble discerning where the dream ends and reality begins. This interesting little quirk always came in handy on the long trips my family took to Florida when I was a kid. It's a pretty long way to go, especially when I was just still a squirmy little bobble-headed toddler who absolutely hated flying in airplanes. Even though the journey itself was always a drag, it was always nice to be able to get away from the cold for a while. You start to forget the feel of the heat of the sun on your face and the endless weeks of grey skies and threatening cloud cover start to drive you crazy. Mom and Dad would work their butts off all year to be able to afford the trip, clocking in overtime and clipping coupons all so we could pack our bags and head off to experience a brief respite from the bitter embrace of old man winter. And it was always worth it. Every single penny. The year I turned 16, my dad decided it would be wise to invest in an RV, which would cut down on our travel cost in the long run. I thought our little house on wheels was the greatest thing I had ever seen. I begged my parents to allow me to live in the RV until it got too cold in the fall, but mom was not having it. She claimed I would probably sneak in on my friends at night to drink beer and smoke pot, which of course was exactly what would have happened. Mom was no fool. Five months after Dad first parked the RV in our driveway, we were hitting the frosty highway and rolling south. It was the first time I'd ever seen the countryside between our hometown and our destination on such a close and personal level. And throughout the journey, I was at turns amazed, astounded, and bored to tears. I watched DVDs and lost myself in daydreams to pass the hours away. But by the time we rumbled past the Georgia-Florida state line, I was more than ready to pit my feet on solid ground for a while. Flying may be expensive and stressful, but it is a heck of a lot faster. We stopped at a rest station near Lake City to load up on vending machine snacks and pump out the sewage tank. As I was checking out the candy bar selection, a deeply tanned older man and a polo shirt and white cargo shorts came wandering up to join me at the vending machine. He looked like a veteran actor of the big screen, still well built in his middle age and handsome in a generic, all-American kind of way. I looked over at him and thought, this guy could sell a ton of kitchen appliances on the home shopping network. He flashed a pearly white grin and said, I like those Snickers bars the best. Leave me a couple, would you? I gave him a dutiful smile in return, and started making polite small talk. I learned his name was Devin, and he was some kind of business big shot back in Arizona. I asked if he had come to Florida to do some wheeling and dealing, and my rest stop acquaintance waved the suggestion away with an air of vague annoyance. He said, Come on now, everyone needs a vacation now and then. And I've been kicking around on this planet for all these years and I've never seen a real, honest-to-goodness swamp land. Now, do not get me wrong. The deserts and the plains are pretty damn magnificent. But hell, you gotta get out there and experience new things. You know what I mean? I want to take it all in. I want to sample everything a place like Florida has to offer. Mom yelled at me across the parking lot to hurry up and get my ass in gear and I realized I had been well on my way to becoming hypnotized by the soothing cadence of Devin's voice. All at once, a small chill skittered down the length of my spine. Something about that grin was making me feel more than a little anxious. I could not help but think that Devin the businessman from Arizona wasn't smiling so much as he was baring his pearly white teeth at me. His gaze was just a little too sharp for someone having a casual conversation with a stranger. I felt like I was being studied, categorized, and filed away for future consideration. 
I took a few steps back and muttered, Well, I gotta go. Nice meeting you. Pleasure was all mine, son. He called after me, still smiling. I hurried back to the RV with the strangest feeling that I had just had a near miss with disaster. For the rest of the duration of the drive to the campgrounds, I kept scanning every passing vehicle for a figure with an aggressively friendly slash of a smile beneath eyes that never seemed to blink. I did not see him, but I could not shake the notion that Devin from Arizona was following us. We pulled into the campground shortly before noon. Dad backed the RV into our rented lot and sprang into action, humming the theme to the A-Team as he hooked up the water and the electricity buzzing around in his electric blue clam digger shorts and matching flip-flops like a tacky little tornado. It was the third week of January, but it was a beautiful 71 degrees outside with a clear blue sky. I could smell the ocean in the breeze and the warmth of the sun's rays against my face. It was intoxicating. When we had pulled out our driveway to hit the road, it had just started snowing again, and it was cold enough to freeze the mucus inside of my nostrils. It felt good to be away from the gray, drudgery of ice and slush, even if it only was for a couple of weeks. I blinked up at the sky and felt my earlier anxiety slide off my shoulders. We were finally here and for the next few weeks, all would be well. Ma and Pa were both pretty bagged from the long day on the road, so we had a mellow day of hanging out beneath the fold-out canopy and roasting hot dogs on our mini-grill. I slept like a rock that night, and when I woke up the next morning, I was raring and ready to do some exploring. My parents had chosen a campground beside one of Florida's many conservation areas that year. I'd been given a new digital camera for my birthday and was excited to use it. Now keep in mind, this was back in the days before cell phones came equipped with half-decent cameras. In fact, I did not even have a mobile phone yet, and would not for several more years. Mom and Dad popped out of the RV at the last second, and instead they tagged along if only to make sure I did not somehow fall into the jaws of the alligators that lived in the stagnant waters of the swamps. I had been planning to burn a bowl or two behind a cypress tree or something, so I was less than enthusiastic when I heard this news. Mom just gave me a knowing smile and patted me on the top of my head. Once again, my mom was no fool. We wandered into the park and took a map from a display in front of a dilapidated building with a faded sign that proclaimed it to be the Visitor's Information Center. I noticed a tall man leaning on the ledge at the open sliding window, chatting with the parks and rec worker inside, and I realized with a nasty start that it was none other than Arizona Devon, the vaguely menacing tourist I had met at the rest stop the day before. He appeared to be flirting with the woman working the information booth, and if the entranced expression on her face was any indication, it appeared to be working. Mom grunted, Come on kiddo, let's go get eaten alive in this dirty damn swamp. She hauled me away by the arm, Dad stomping along behind us in his mirrored sunglasses and a ridiculous smear of zinc oxide along the length of his nose. My mom managed to convince him to change out the flip-flops, but he refused her demand to not change into another pair of his cringe-inducing clam diggers. They were banana yellow in color, and they flapped around his shins as he walked, which provided enough hilarity for me to almost forget about the unexpected appearance of Mr. Arizona with his impeccably combed hair and sparkling slash of a grin. Almost, that is. I looked back over my shoulder just in time to see Devin disappearing through the front door of the building, which was being held open for him by the woman from the information booth. She had an expression of rapturous adoration in her face, as if she were completely enthralled by his presence. The door clunked shut, and I found myself slowing to a halt staring after them with a strange lump of dread in my stomach. Dad blundered into me from behind and bellowed. Watch where you're going, dummy. I'm trying to look at the map here. I scurried away from his irritation and hurried after my mom, who was marching along the trail at a brisk power walker's pace. She snapped. Hurry up, you two. You both need more exercise. Especially you, Harold. You sit there every night eating those potato chips and watching the TV. And you t Just look at that gut. 
You were starting to look pregnant. Dad muttered, Huh, you're a riot, ain't ya? And shoved the map in his back pocket. Mom militantly marched us along the trail like a drill instructor, hectoring us to keep up the pace. Until we finally rebelled and stopped at a footbridge to take some pictures. The footbridge spanned a watery stretch that deepened as it led out into deeper reaches of the swamp. As I looked down into the dark sheen of the sluggish water below our feet, there was a rolling disturbance on the surface and I caught a brief glimpse of a thick, scaly tail. I tried to snap a quick picture but the alligator was already gone, leaving only bubbles and ripples in its wake. Dad whistled and said, Holy moly, that was a big one. I read they don't really attack people very often, but I sure as hell don't want to get too close to one if I could help it. Mom smirked and made a jab about alligators preferring a low-fat diet, which made Dad clench his teeth and shoot back. You're right. What am I scared of alligators for when I already live with a goddamn harpy? They started to bicker at each other, and I interrupted by pointedly clearing my throat and grumbling. Mom? Dad? Can you guys just, like, walk ahead of me or something? Argue somewhere I don't gotta hear it for crying out loud? Mom snapped. Why, so you can smoke some pot? Fine. Come on, Harold. Let your pothead son get his fix or whatever he calls it. Let's go. Dad shot me a dark look and growled. You better not have any dope on you, kid. We drove across state lines. They walked away in a huff, still taking cranky little jabs at each other, and I shook my head as they stomped out of sight. As soon as they were gone, I pulled out my pipe and my bag. Mom was right, of course. I offered my father a silent apology and packed a bowl. The swamp took on an ethereal dreamlike quality as the THC soaked into my brain. I was still pretty new to smoking pot, and like most beginners, when I got high, I got really high. The smoke hit me like a sack of spongy bricks, Whomp. and I was soon blinking out at cypress trees with red eyes and a dopey grin on my face. It struck me that this was an ancient place, fundamentally unchanged for thousands of years. I drifted into a daydream of what life had been for the first human inhabitants, generation after generation, living and dying within the groves, stalked by panthers and stalking them in turn, dancing around a fire beneath a blaze of stars over the canopy, sweating in syncopated rhythm in the humid air, hunting and fighting and loving and fearing the embrace of death. A hand suddenly descended on my shoulder, making me screech and jump six inches in the air. I whirled around and discovered the lady from the visitor's information center standing behind me. She let out a strangely mechanical giggle and said, Whoa, you're a jumpy one, aren't you? I think one of you guys must have dropped this. She handed me a dirty, wrinkled map. The same map my dad stuffed into the back pocket of his hideous shorts earlier in our ill-fated family hike through the park. I took it from her and offered a sheepish apology for littering. She gave me a grin and chirped, Hey, no problem, accidents happen. Where'd your parents go? I knew that she could smell the weed in the air. I tried to put on an air of casual unconcern and said, Oh, they're just up a little way. They, um... I trailed off and stared at her with growing unease. There was something about the park lady's grin that was unsettlingly familiar. I gotta get going, I finished and tried to smile back. Thanks for picking up the map for us. See ya. I took maybe five steps before I was stopped dead by the sound of Devin's voice booming out from behind me. Full of hearty and dark good humor, he said. I peeked into your head, and I saw it too. The natives and fire, the stars and the night sky, all of it. You have got the sight, kid. I knew from the moment I smelled your scent at the rest stop. A lot of people have a touch of the sight, just a touch, but not like you. In another life, you would have made a great medicine man. I slowly turned around with my heart beating hard in my chest. The lady from the information booth was gone, and Devin stood in her place. He held up a red hairband and said, That's all I need. A life. A personal item. And there it is. I will own her face for the rest of my years. Pretty neat trick, huh? Uh, I gaped at him, too shocked to speak out loud. Finally, I cleared my throat and squeaked. What? What are you? I mean, 
Holy crap, how did you do that? Devin tucked the hairband in the breast pocket of his shirt and said, Well, I guess you could call me a witch. A very specific kind of witch. Folks back home would call me a skimwalker. Personally, I don't like that name very much, but it's what they'd call me. I slowly shook my head, my jaw hanging open in shock, and Devin clicked his tongue in disappointment. It's true. Now, I would tell you something. Boy, I'm an old son of a gun. No, no. I can remember watching Abraham Lincoln roll past in a convoy of horse-drawn buggies. That is how old I am. See this face here? This is not me. I killed this man in the bottom of a gas station years ago. Ate him right up. My real face? Well, you don't ever want to see that, believe me. If I show you my true face, it'll be the last thing you ever see. I could do nothing but shake my head again. I was struggling to keep myself from fainting dead away from fright. Devin beamed at my fear and shook his head in unison with my mute denial. He exclaimed, Well, you're going to see for yourself, one way or another. Let us get down to business, partner. I'm a businessman, after all. See, I am tired of kicking around the empty old desert all the time. Everyone needs a vacation now and then. Sure, but me, I need something more uh, substantial than that. Call it a leave of absence, if you will. I want to see the world, but it is not nearly so much fun when you're doing it alone. It would be nice to have a travel buddy or two. I could teach you, kid. I could show you how to be like me. I could teach you how to wear different faces. You could live so long it might as well be forever. What do you think of that? My answer was to abruptly whirl around and start running my ass off. I tried to get off the footbridge as quick as possible. The thing behind me snarled. Ugh, that was a real bad choice, kid. And heavy footsteps pounded on the splintery old boards behind me. I screamed for help, but the air around me became thick and curiously flat. My voice fell dead inches from my lips. Ain't nobody gonna help you. The skimwalker screamed, and in his voice it was, it was so dark and triumphant with hunger. The confident greed of a predator who never fails to secure its prey. I do not know if it was from the extreme stress of the situation at hand, but all at once my mind drifted sideways, and from one footfall to the next I stepped out of reality and into the daydream. The natives were gathered at the other side of the bridge, the ancient one from another time. They looked like they were pissed right off. One of them drew back his bow and uttered a hoarse war cry and let the arrow fly. The stone-tipped projectile whistled past my head and I heard it thunk into my pursuer. It was only a scant moment away from sinking its claws into my back. It let out a jagged screech of surprise and agony. I turned just in time to see a towering, slump-shouldered figure stagger back into a guardrail and flip over to the water below with a tremendous splash. The arrow was protruding from its eye socket. The monstrous thing fought and struggled to the surface. I had time to roar. I'll leave you alive. And then a churning commotion boiled in with eerie speed. Several streaks of boiling water and whipping tails from all directions. The skimwalker opened his cavernous mouth to scream again, and it was yanked underneath with tremendous force. There was more gurgled screaming, a lot of flailing of arms and legs, and the water went red with blood. Devin the Skimwalker may have been a big deal out there in the deserts of Arizona, but in the watery swamplands of central Florida, the mighty alligator reigned supreme. I stood at the bank and watched as its struggles grew rapidly weaker. When I saw an arm float to the surface, I knew it was done. I started to turn away, but something bobbling in the water caught my eye. I fished it out with a stick and stared at it with horror. I had been hoping... The whole incident was just a part of my hyper-realistic daydream, but the dripping hair tie I was holding was very real. I tucked it away in my pocket and whispered, Tourists gotta watch out for the gators, Devin. Everyone knows that. I was surprised to see the natives from the daydream were still gathered near the end of the bridge. 
I raised a hand to them, and they returned my greeting, their faces solemn and watchful. One of them pointed to himself, then to me, and then up to the sky. With that, they faded away into nothing before my eyes. I am not completely sure what he was trying to say. Not exactly, but I think I got the gist of it. He was a part of me, and we were both parts of a greater reality. I hurried up to catch my mom and dad before I stepped to throw up into some bushes. My heart was pounding, and my legs were shaking uncontrollably. I felt like I might pass out. I gasped, holy crap, and I wiped my mouth with the side of my shirt. Wow, now I know this is a pretty big pill to swallow, but there's still more. After I was finished tossing up my breakfast, I ran ahead on the trail, but I could not find my parents anywhere. I eventually doubled back and found them standing on the bridge, yelling my name at the top of my lungs. Mom freaked the hell out when I came jogging up to them. She said they came sneaking back to the bridge shortly after they'd left in an effort to catch me in the act of smoking my illicit dope, but I was nowhere to be seen. It was almost as if I had disappeared into thin air. Dad spotted what looked like a shoe floating just below the surface, and they both promptly went into hysterics. They thought I actually somehow ended up falling into the water and was eaten alive by gators. I looked down into the water and there was in fact a shoe bobbing around a few yards away from the bridge. It was one of Devin's spiffy boat shoes, and I was fairly sure there was still a foot inside of it. Although, I obviously did not share this fact with my parents. It must have broken off during the feeding frenzy. Staring at it made a wave of nausea roll through my guts, and I promptly looked away. I calmed my parents down by telling them that they were right. Being the conniving teenage miscreant that I was, I had tricked them into walking ahead, and that I'd slipped away from the trail to smoke a few bowls because I was a dirty, disrespectful little bastard of a pothead. I stoically endured the rain of slaps delivered by my enraged mother, who had, who had been a mere second away from melting down into a full-blown fit before I came scrambling down the trail. They confiscated my pipe and weed, and mom declared that I was grounded for the duration of the vacation. No TV, no sightseeing, no fun at all. I pretended to be heartbroken, with disappointment, but in reality that was just fine and dandy by me. I just had more than enough excitement to last me quite a while. I overheard my mom and dad talking about the disappearance of a park employee the next day. Dad put forth the possibility that the shoe he had seen in the water may have belonged to her, and mom being a true crime fanatic since the early 90s, breathlessly speculated she may have been killed by a jilted ex-boyfriend. I gazed into an open magazine and pretended not to hear the conversation. The shoe had not belonged to the missing park employee, but the hair tie in my pocket certainly did, and I knew the police would never find her body. She had been devoured, whole and screaming, by a monster wearing stolen skin. And then, in an ironic twist of fate, the ancient creature finally got a taste of its own medicine, so to speak, at the jaws of the alligators. <laughs> Sorry about that. I do not usually like puns, but this one time, I could not resist. As for me, I still have daydreams sometimes, although it is never as vivid and real to me as it was when I was a kid. As the years passed, I found myself doubting the incident, and actually, I thought that maybe I made it up at one point. It seems far more likely that I suffered from some kind of epileptic, petite mal seizures, as kids sometimes do, and the whole thing was just an hallucination or something. Or, so I tell myself anyway. It does not explain the hair tie, nor does it explain the broken arrow shaft floating in the water. I ended up throwing the hair tie out the window as we were heading back home, up the I-95, I didn't want it anymore. Looking at it made me feel weird and, you know, I don't want to have evidence like that on me. I may have possessed the power of clairvoyance once upon a time. Or I may have had a childhood of neurological disorder. I cannot say for sure which one is correct. But I can say this. Even monsters need to go on vacation now and then. And when they do, they should probably stay within their element if they know what I mean. Because no matter how big and bad a monster you are, there is always something a whole lot worse. Thanks for listening to this creepy and downright terrifying Skimwalker Encounter story. If you enjoyed this story, please be sure to hit that like button as it helps me out in the YouTube algorithm. 
If you're new to the swamp, why not join us? Hit the subscribe button and turn on notifications to never miss a new video, as I upload them almost every single day, in all things natural and supernatural. If you have a story that you would like to share in a future video, whether it be a skimwalker encounter or something else, be sure to submit your story at swampdweller.net or the email you can find in the description down below. I'd love to share your story with everyone here in the swamp. It's stories like yours that help keep this show going on a daily basis. If you want to support the swamp outside of hitting that like button and subscribing, maybe check out the merch store. I've got face masks, t-shirts, hoodies, mugs, and much more. I'd appreciate you guys if you checked it out. If you're on the go and don't have YouTube Premium, you can download and bring your favorite Swamp Dweller scary stories with you everywhere you go. You can do that on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher Radio, and pretty much everywhere else that you find your favorite podcast online. The best part of it all is that it's 100% free. Thank you guys, as always, for supporting the Swamp the way you do. I couldn't do this without you guys on a daily basis. This story today was written by a very good friend of mine and one of my favorite authors, T.W. Grimm. He really did a good job on this story and I hope you guys enjoyed it. Please let me know your thoughts below. I'll see you guys soon with another creepy video.